good at all the different points of intersection. Well, why don't we um, get started? I'm looking, I think that everybody who has been here has been here, right? Nobody's joining us new because that would be um, and then whoever joins us along the way, if they're able, great. And, and if not, we'll have a, we'll have a conversation among us. Okay, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to mute you only for background noise. Unmute yourself if you have a question um, or a comment, please, or, or put it in the chat. But, but more likely that I'll hear you um, more promptly if you put it, uh, if, you, if you unmute yourself, okay? It's not muted. No, I haven't muted you yet. Don't say don't say anything you know inappropriate. I haven't muted you yet. <laughs> and we're and, class, and, we're, and we're recording. And we're recording. And send it out to everyone. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. So you should be able, yes, to see. Yes, thumbs up if you just give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen. Great. Okay. So much easier to do it like this than uh, to be navigating things uh, at Temple. I know that, thank you for your patience, we're getting there. It's, uh, um, that is a whole other work in progress is, is layering all the different pieces of the technology so that everybody can be there. So Rabbi Moses Ben Maimon, we are studying, you know, his dates, we've been studying him for a while. This is perhaps what he looked like. This is just a recap because we're gonna do, um, we're gonna do a little bit of work kind of from, from both of his, um, both of his works from the Mishnah Torah and from Guide for the Perplexed. That's just a quick recap if you need to, to read it over. Um, I, I find that sometimes I need a, a tickler uh, just from week to week, just to remember which is which in, in, in different courses that I'm studying. So this is just a recap of his work, Mishnah Torah, the earlier commentary on the Mishnah, Guide for the Perplexed, a much different uh, more, more philosophical look at, uh, at the big questions in life, but, but the guide for the perplex is really uh, using the Mishnah Torah um, and before the Mishnah Torah, the Mishnah as, as its foundation. So if you were going to kind of build blocks, it would be, you know, with the, the Mishnah, the Mishnah Torah, the guide for the perplex, right? Each kind of resting one on another. And actually before the Mishnah would be the, the, the Bible. So actually that's probably helpful. So you'd have, you know, the Bible as your primary text. You'd have the Talmud, that's the Talmud, that's the Mishnah and the Gemara as your second text. That's around 200 of the common era. Then you would have the Mishnah Torah, which is Rambam's writings. So you see the dates there. And then the guide for the perplex. Okay, so if you're, if you're a chronological thinker, that's, uh, that's kind of how that all, all comes together. This we've seen before. Uh, this is the guide for perplexed. You've seen this before too. I just wanted you to see a quick look again for a refresher of where how it came to be. This is the, the books in the guide to the perplex that we started to, uh, to go into. And last week, I heard loud and clear that you were, um, your, your uh, interest was piqued around the question of free will. So Les, thank you for that. I, I heard, uh, I heard your, your thoughts, but I've actually heard others, um, you know, um, musing and struggling and wondering and curious about the same thing. So I thought we would look a little, a little more closely at Maimonides and free will and, and what Judaism has to say about, about free will. Uh, so you, you see here, right, according to the Bible, the Jews were given the Torah and commanded to follow its precepts. This we know, right, with reward and retribution to be meted out accordingly. Right, so so this is this has been pretty clear. It's not the same in every faith tradition, right? So for Judaism to make sense, it has to be is is you know what Maimonides posits that we have free will. That in and of itself is not an easy statement, right? Right? How do we understand because we have the Torah, because we accept the Torah? Now you can be given something and not accept it, right? You can be given something and accept it reluctantly. You can be given something and and take it wholeheartedly. And then the next layer of reward or punishment or reward or consequence that is, is the next layer. How does that all make sense, right? And, and does that influence free will? So that's what we're, where we're gonna do a little bit of looking at. So here, would somebody like to read? This is, this is, you know, this is the, the, the very powerful text that we read at the holidays from Deuteronomy. Would someone like, there's no hard words at all. Would somebody like to, uh, to, to read the English of the text? So you can just unmute and read it from Deuteronomy 30. See, I set before you this day life and prosperity, death and adversity. 
For I command you this day to love the eternal your God, to walk in God's ways, and to keep God's commandments, laws, and rules, that you may thrive and increase, that the eternal your God may bless you in the land that you are about to enter and possess. But if your heart turns away and you give no heed, and are lured into the worship and service of other gods, I declare to you this day that you shall certainly perish. You shall not long endure on the soil that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. And I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. I have put before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life if you and your offspring would live. I thought that would be a light way to start the morning <clears throat> or the afternoon, I guess, the afternoon. So you've seen this is not an unfamiliar text, I'm guessing to most of you, right? This is a test that a text that you know. So under the auspice of free will, right? As we're looking at this concept of free will, will and, and what Maimonides has to say, tell me just this is the shot level, right? This is the surface level of the text. What do you pull out from this text just on the surface, just at a cold, one cold read at 12.0, wherever we are, at 12.09? What, what, are, what are any of the words, any of the concepts, any of the, anything that jumps out at you? It's up to you. Yes. What else? What else to add to Joyce? Uh, well, that it's very clear that you can have a, a good and rich and fulfilling life if you follow the commandments and if not you will perish that's it's pretty stark yeah it's it, it right it's not just reward and punishment it's reward and death right mm -hmm. it's blessing and curse right it's not just it might not you might not fear as well right yeah Les, go ahead were you gonna you were gonna add something well i mean it's basically what you said though uh, you know you have a choice but uh, it's not really a choice uh you either do what I say or you die. And, um, you know, that is free will in a sense, <laughs> but the consequences uh, sort of make it uh, an interesting kind of free will. Let's put it that way. An offer you can't refuse. <laughs> One specific is that uh, you are lured into the worship and service of other gods. And I thought that was interesting. That's the one specific thing that's in there. So, so Marsha, right? And, 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 and I hope also you're taking, bringing with you your Torah study learning, right? Our Saturday morning Torah study learning. Why, why is that? Why does that catch your attention? Because that is a theme running through that always the fear of that, uh, that people will uh, get into observances of other gods because they're living among other people peoples where other gods are worshipped and so it's it would be very easy to fall into that the competition is stiff right the competition is stiff yeah yeah last please is this speaking only to jews um i ask that because um he talked it talks about other gods and there's nothing that says that people who aren't jews who worship other gods are not going to survive uh, am i reading this correctly Right. So, right. It's, it's such a good question, right? Is this command to the Israelites? The answer is yes. Is it yes? Right. In a time that we're looking for monotheism, right? It was there. Um, was there a hope that was there a thought that that God was setting this before all the peoples, or that the Torah was given to us as the Israelites, as the Jews, and ours and ours alone? And and the answer is yes. It's meant for us, with with a, an eye toward uh, no amongst whom you are living. Anything else, anything else at all that you're, that you're catching from here? Yes, Marlene, please. Um, oh, uh, based on a re another recent discussion we had at services, I think, I'm, I'm looking at the word C, and I know it's not the colloquial C, da, da, da. So uh, rather than listen, it's saying C. I'm wondering what you think about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually, I meant to bring my Tanakh with me, and I think... Um, hold on. Here's the nice thing about working at home. Just give me one second. One second.
kind of a new world, Golda, isn't it? That I can just uh, open the sliding door behind me and pick up my Tanakh. Although I guess if we were sitting at temple, I would have that too. Deuteronomy, let's look and see what the Hebrew, I don't know if anybody's got the Hebrew with them. Deuteronomy 30. What what is it, um, Marlene, that that um, you're wondering about in particular? Well, that rather than say hear me, it says see. Yeah, yeah, and it is re, it is re, it is see, just from ro to see. So I'm wondering about the significance of that. What is that unusual way to to put it? Uh, you know, what 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 word were you thinking would would be there? Well, re, you know, listen or hark or listen to uh, my words. You know. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, yeah, interesting, right? Because we just talked about, um, you know, the, the, the moment at Mount Sinai where the people saw the thunder. Right. 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 You know, what, what was it? What kind of what was the understanding with our senses? Right. How, how, how are we to, to grab a hold of things? Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, yeah. 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 It's clearly meant to draw our attention. Right. right. Pay attention. Listen up. Right. Right. Uh, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It could have. It could have been an easier, a different word. But but is there something about the actual visual scene? And then, uh, and then we're going to look in a second. You know, in a couple minutes, what does it mean for people who can't see? Are they not obligated? Right. And we're going to look at the combination between obligation, and free will, and what happens if you can't fulfill that obligation? Yeah. Last, please. To see something, I think, is much broader than to hear it. You seeing it. In my mind uh, is also imagination and and seeing it in your mind as opposed to just looking at something. Whereas if you hear it, you know you may listen but not really process it. Just just the thought. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A anything else at all from from? Yeah, please, Joyce. Well, this may be an extraneous thought, but it recalled to mind for me the the uh, habit that has seemed to have developed among pundits uh, who, uh, who are uh, trying to make a point uh, and who say, start with look. And I always, I find it a bit, it sounds paternalistic or something to me, but it's, but it's interesting that it just brought that to mind, like look, <laughs> you know, I, I've got the word and, and you need to see it. <laughs> Hmm. So Andrew, that's interesting. Um, the way your your tone your your tone um, bespeaks something, right? Uh -huh. And uh -huh. and the you know the, the shot level the the surface level of the word is just see, right? It's just see. And and so interesting to, to know the value the the value we attach to, to the words, right? Is it is it a um, um, is it a commanding God, right? We certainly know in Deuteronomy that it is a firm handed God, right? That the God that we read about in Deuteronomy is. Um, a, a, a strict commanding obedience and faithfulness and um, a punitive God, right? A punitive God. And that language would be fitting that what you're calling paternalistic, you, you know, would be fitting in, a, in our, our look at a Deuteronomy God. And certainly for this concept around free will. Absolutely. It's a, that, it's a very interesting point that you bring up. Yeah. Yeah. Anything, anything else at all? I'm going to stop the share for one second. I want to um, read something. I think I've told you about this book, which is good. It's, I think I put it last time. It's the Maimonides Reader by um, Isidore Tversky, um, which I, among the many books on, on Maimonides, I would encourage you to, uh, uh, to get this one. But so I want to go now to our discussion of free will and, and, uh, and where we factor in and whether it's nature or nurture, according to my, my mom. So I'm gonna read to you, and I'm sorry, it was too much. There was no way to put it up on the screen properly. We're gonna look at some other screens in a couple of minutes, but best you can. And I, let me actually put on the live transcript for those for whom it might be helpful. Um, can you see the live transcript now? Is it running? Yeah, okay, so yeah. If you don't want the live transcript running, um, go to your CC. Um, or your, um, you, you might have an arrow and you can, you can um, just turn off the, or hide the closed captioning if you want it. Okay, you can hide the subtitles is what it says. But let me leave those on for those who want it because I sometimes read quickly and hopefully it will catch um, what you need. So this is concerning the natural disposition of man and this dovetails for Maimonides. This is, this is his, his thoughts, some of his initial thoughts around free will. It is impossible for man to be born endowed by nature 
from his very birth with either virtue or vice, just as it is impossible that he should be born skilled by nature in any particular art. Mm -hmm. It is possible, however, that through natural causes, he may from birth be so constituted as to have a predilection for a particular virtue or vice, so that he will more readily practice it than any other. Okay, so far so good? So far so good, yeah. For instance, a man whose natural constitution, I love his, um, his style, a man whose natural constitution inclines toward dryness, whose brain matter is clear and not overloaded with fluids, finds it much easier to learn, remember, and understand things than the phlegmatic man whose brain is encumbered with a great deal of humidity. Doctor, I think we have at least one doctor on the on on with with all right. Such an interesting uh, term, right? And we know that Maimonides was was a, a doctor. But if one who inclines constitutionally toward a certain excellence is left entirely without instruction, and if his faculties are not stimulated, he will undoubtedly remain arrogant. On the other hand, if one by nature dull and phlegmatic, possessing an abundance of humidity, is instructed and enlightened, he will. Though with difficulty, it is true, gradually succeed in acquiring knowledge and understanding. So far, so good? Yes, yeah, last please, just unmute yourself and ask. Unless you have a question about being phlegmatic and then I'm gonna leave it to you. Well, um, I'm old, I just forgot what I was gonna say. Uh, it, what, the first thing that comes to mind is this is sort of the end of original sin. Go ahead, I'm listening. Not ours, but I'm listening. Uh, and the the other thing is that you're born with a certain bent, a certain constitution. Right. Constitution, but you can change it. This is where he's going. This is where he's going. Wait, we're almost there. We're almost there. In exactly the same way, he whose blood is somewhat warmer than is necessary has the requisite requisite quality to make him a brave man. Another, however, the temperament of whose heart is colder than it should be is naturally inclined toward cowardice and fear, so that if he should be taught and trained to be a coward, he would easily become one. If, however, he desired to be a brave, to, if, however, it be desired to make a brave man of him, he can without doubt become one, provided he received the proper training, which would require, of course, great exertion. So this goes to your point. I've entered into the subject, Maimonides writes, so you may not believe the absurd ideas of astrologers who falsely assert that the constellation at the time of one's birth determines whether one is to be virtuous or vicious, the individual being thus necessarily compelled to follow at a certain line of conduct. We, on the contrary, are convinced that our law agrees with Greek philosophy, which substantiates with, con with convincing proofs the contention that man's conduct is entirely in his own hands. So less goes in part to your point, right? Goes in part to your point that, right, we might be born with a certain constitution, but just because of how we are born or the constellation under which we are born, that doesn't dictate how we, we are to live, right? That, that's that's his, his preamble, his preamble. Go ahead, unmute if you have, I see some thoughts. Yeah, go ahead. I think it's interesting. He talks about the constellation under which we were born. I mean, he's, he's talking about, uh, you know, um, the Greeks, I guess, who were looking at the stars and, and your your sense, you know, was was what month you were born in, what constellation you were born in. Of course, people still look at it today. <laughs> and he's saying it's not, it's, it's, that's not it. Right? It's, that's right. right. Yeah. yeah that, that's not it. Right. You can pay attention to that, but that's not it. So he, he understands that there are other ideas and other people, and he's really addressing those, those people not to those people, but those ideas and people to the Jews, which I think is sort of interesting. Okay, good for me to, to go on to screen share. I'll show you the next bit of his, we're gonna actually look at some of his writing, unless there are any other comments. Yeah, I, Please. Um, yeah, I think it, it's uh, striking that he says, it is entirely in your own hands because previously he's really been talking about training and so in some ways, it seems to me that that speaks to all of the kind of training that Jews have uh, and, and links up with Musar, you know, and all of that. Um, so you have to have, you have to go to the 
trough, I guess, you know, or be willing and open, but it's not simply a decision on one's own part to, uh, to get, to be able to get there. You're neither, it's neither predetermined, or you're not just born a certain way. And, and so it is, you're just stuck with it, right? Neither is it just going to happen just because you want it to happen, right? That's kind of when we went, when I talked about those little buckets that you have to put around the fountain, right, to count, to, to catch, right? What would he, what would, what would Maimonides say is the way to get there? What, what, think about his, his critical works. And I'll give you a hint. It's not guide to the perplexed. What, what, what would Maimonides say is the way to get there, to change, to change or to, to, to develop your proper ways? Mishnah. The yes, right, right. The commandments, the laws. The laws, right, as he's elucidated them, right, as he has expounded upon them in, the, in his mitzvah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to go back and we are going to, let's look at his text. We stopped. So here we are in his fifth chapter of the Laws of Repentance. This is from its Mishnah Torah, where he talks about whether we have the free will to choose between good and evil. And he implies that most philosophically unsophisticated Jews of his time thought that man does not have free will and that all of our actions are, actions are decreed by God. This is what Rambam thought. Okay, so we're going to go into, into this. So who would like to, this is from his Mishnah Torah around free will. Who would like to read this slide? We've got a good handful of slides. So um, if people would just unmute as, as you see fit and, and read one of them, that would be great. I'll read this first one and then you can warm up for the second one. Free will is granted to all men. If one desires to turn himself to the path of good and be righteous, the choice is his. Should he desire to turn to the path of evil and be wicked, the choice is also his. This is the intent of the Torah statement from Genesis. Behold, man has become unique as ourselves, knowing good and evil. The human species became singular in the world with no other species resembling the following quality. That man can, on his own initiative, with his knowledge and thought, know good and evil, and do what he desires. There is no one who can prevent him from doing good or bad. Accordingly, right? Parenthetically, there was a need to drive him from the Garden of Eden, lest he stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life, right? What, read that last little bit. There is no one who can prevent him from doing good or bad accordingly, right? There was a need to drive him from the Garden of Eden, lest he stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life. Lest you already pointed to the original sin, right? Not ours, but, but conceptually, we get it even in our read of it. What's happening here? I don't understand the lest he stretch out his hand and take from it. He already did. Right. So, I mean, the word lest is, is confusing me. Would you explain? Well, what, friends, what, what do you think? What is it? Was there a need? Why, why were they cast out? Why well, were they because, cast out? because he uh, took from the tree of life. He took from, he took from knowledge. But um, accordingly, lest he stretch out his hand, that would mean... If he didn't take it, I, I'm, I'm confused by the sentence. I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me read you the biblical text. Um, God then said, look, the humans are, so this is from Genesis 3.20. Okay, just back a little bit. Um, the man called his wife's name Eve, for she would be the mother of all living. And God made outfits out of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. God then said, Look, the humans are like us, knowing all things. Now they may even reach out to take fruit from the tree of life and eat and live forever. That's verse 22. So God drove them out of the Garden of Eden to work the soil from which they had been taken, expelling the humans and stationing Jeroboam, right? It goes on and on and on, right? And, uh, and, and right, what, what is, right? Was it a, a, a caution? Was it a caution? Was it a punishment? Did God not imbue them with free will to make that decision? Why make them with free will and then punish them for it? Okay. Well, actions have consequences. I mean, having free will doesn't give you uh, ultimate power. It just gives you free will to choose from good and evil. Um, so I, I understand the punishment, but, and, but also I don't understand something that you read, um, live 
talking about living eternally. I thought if they were in the Garden of Eden, they would live eternally. I, maybe I'm confused about that too. Right, but but in fact, that's what they had thought, right? That they would live eternally, right? From, yeah. from taking from the fruit, right? But, but we know in their decision because they were hidden from doing oh, I, so, right? Okay, so that was but, their, okay. Let, let, let's let's see, maybe the next slide will, will help to, to um, uh, to, to, to illuminate things a little bit. So this is a continuation of his passage. Who would like to read this? I'll read. Next. This was implied by the prophet Jeremiah. No, 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 up top, sorry, up top, number two. Can you see number two? Oh, okay, yeah, I didn't realize, okay. A person should not entertain the thesis held by the fools among the Gentiles and the majority of the un underdeveloped among Israel that at the time of man's creation, the Holy One, blessed be he, decrees whether he will be righteous or wicked. This is untrue. Each person is fit to be righteous like Moses, our teacher, or wicked like Jeroboam. Jeroboam. Similarly, he may be wise or fo foolish, merciful or cruel, miserly or generous, or acquire any other character traits. There is no one who compels him, sentences him, or leads him toward either of these two paths. Rather, he, on his own initiative and decision, tends to the path he chooses. Continue? Or, Please. Uh, this, was in, this was implied by the prophet Jeremiah, who stated in Icach 338, from the mouth of the Most High, neither evil or good comes forth. The Creator does not decree that a person shall be good and refrain from being evil. Accordingly, it is the sinner himself who causes his own loss. Thank you. It, not much to process, I know, right? It's 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 again some some light light some light reading. So what's happening here, right? What, what is Maimonides? What is Maimonides saying to us? Right. What's he saying? He's saying free will with consequences. Right. Right. And that you're not compelled. And it's interesting. We're going to read a little bit further. Right. Nobody says you have to do it this way or that way. Your choice. Right. It's your cho choice. And you tend to the path that you choose. Right. But somebody says what the consequences are. I mean, you know what they are, but they're they're given from some other place, which I'm assuming would be from God in this in this sense. Your assumption is, is abundantly correct. <laughs> that, that, that's that's the essence, right? That that's the, the essence in this model, right? That 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 God is the arbiter, right? God is God is the one who's setting setting the uh, the the, um, the rules as it as it were, right? God God is the one who's giving the law, and then it's your choice. Right, it's your choice, knowing what you know, right? We, we read the Deuteronomy text, right? Knowing what you know, it's your choice to follow them or not, knowing, as you say, right, what the consequences are. But there's nobody ultimately who compels you, right, or sentences you or leads you toward either of those two paths. Ultimately, the choice is yours, right? It's what my mind, we're, we're not done yet, by the way. I, I see some, some knitted brows, right? But ultimately, the choice is yours. Yes, Marsha and then Marlene. Yeah. Um, but when he says there is no one who compels him, sentences his, or leads him towards either of these two paths, but there are people who influence you about where you're going. And uh, often those influences are very strong. Um, you know, we talk, and so it, it can be very difficult for some people to choose the right path of everybody around them is going the other way. It is exactly what he's writing about, right? It is exactly what he's writing about, not just for the individual, but for a nation, right? For a nation who, who um, right? For a nation who has always lived in a host culture, right? We've always lived in and amongst other people, right? We saw, Marcia, you pointed to it earlier, right? We saw the, the, the prohibition and it's a steady drumbeat not to follow other gods, right? You, you, you make the choice that you should make is kind of the, 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 the uh, supposition, right? Um, because there are other influences out there, right? You can look on the, on, the, on, the, um, on the meta level, 
right? And you can look on, on, on the much smaller level, right? Right. You can look on the, I don't care, you know, as a mother, I don't care what everybody else is doing. You're, they're not my kid, right? No, you may not. And uh, this is what's happening in, in the world around you. And you have to make your choices knowing that around that, right? That's, that's, that's on, a, on a secular level, right? In, in broad brush strokes. Marlene, Marlene and then, Marlene and then Les. Um, well, what Marsha was talking about just reminds me so much of, you know, supposedly an adolescent thing of, oh, well, everybody else is doing it. Um, and we see, of course, recently, not just adolescents, but the thing also, the thing that struck me was um, like, you can't really, this strong thing that it, you and you alone really are responsible for the consequences of your actions. Like you can't really blame God for punishing you because it was totally your choice to do that thing. That, that came across very strongly to me in this passage. Yeah, yeah, a, a hard pill to swallow, right? But, but, but yes, you know, you, you know, distilled all the way down. I, I, I think that that is exactly what my mom used to say. Yeah, yeah, Lester. Well, this reminds me of God as the royal or parental model. You know, Abino um, Machenu. He's saying that there's there's a right and wrong. There's a guidance. You're living in this household, this family, and um, I am the old text, the father. The new text, the parent. Um, and uh, there are consequences, you know, the rules, and here's how we play them. So the one big family. Say again. You're, you're muted, Lester. Okay, um, right, it, it is, it, this, this is what we hear, right? This is the high holiday God, right? This is the high holiday God that, that, that many of us wrestle with, right? A, a, you know, a who by fire, who by water God is, is um, not that what this can be distilled down to, but, but it is certainly a sense of, of reward and punishment and the choice is yours. And, and I'm setting it out before you and it's clear, right? The Deuteronomy text is our frame, but not the end of our frame. It's not the end of our frame. And I don't want us to get um, stuck only in the shot level, in the surface level of the read, which is only this because we would do, we would do his teachings, his teachings and our Jewish philosophy a disservice if we got stuck only there. Joyce, go ahead. I'm troubled by the, uh, the next to last sentence where it feels to me contradictory for all that has come before, that the creator does not decree that a person should be good and refrain from being evil. Uh, it seems to me everything that has gone before has indicated that you get to choose. And I, I okay, but when you, you know, if you're going to, you're going to get to choose between uh, life and death, you're going to get to choose. It's very clear that to me that there's a, you may not say should, but there's a should in there. Right. There's a right way and there's a wrong way, right? It's definitive. It's definitive. You follow my law and live well. Don't follow my law and you won't, right? But, but this is, this is the crux of free will. God could have made us without free will. God could have made us, you, you know, um, to, to, you know, an, an omnipotent God versus an, an omniscient God, right? An all-powerful God could have made us just that way, right? Obedient. That's not that's not what what our Torah text teaches us, and that's not what Rambam is teaching us, right? He's saying that God actually chose to make us with free will, so that the choosing would be ours, as you say, Marlene, knowing knowing what the consequences uh, could be could could be right now there's a whole enormous gray area uh that we could look at uh you, you know people who live virtuous and righteous lives and and what happens there and people who live according to the law and and who die terrible deaths or who suffer tremendously or the whole book of job right i mean like we could go on and on and on but those are those are um abundantly worth worth our study um but but for now we're going to go bain on we're going to go in the middle to look at some of his teachings so let me let me go on just in the, in the interest of time marlene yeah, quickly, I'm gonna, just, oh, a, just yeah. a quick thing on yeah. uh, on what joyce said i'm kind of wondering that that sentence that's troubling her and me and maybe all of us um i'm wondering if that word should might be would he's not saying that we would be good but if it's our choice but if we're not good then we'll have consequences the word should there is is confusing i think 
Okay, so if it read, the creator does not decree that a person would be good. Yeah, that makes sense to me. In our good reform ears, it does, right? 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 Yeah. To our reform thinking, contemporary ears, it sounds better, right? Right. Yeah, we have a, we, we have um, we have a, a tenuous relationship, I think, in the reform movement with obligation, right? The sense of being commanded. Um, it, it is the very break for our movement, right? It, it is this sense of uh, the 613 commandments, I get them, but I, I, can, I can very clearly say to you, I don't care if I'm wearing linen and wool in the same garment. I'm not going to murder, right? I'm not going to steal. I'm not, right? but really, I, I don't care about wearing linen. That's a, that's a commandment, right? I, I, that, that is one that, right? The whole, there are a whole bunch of them that, that I have chosen not to observe, not to observe, right? So where does that put me in this system, right? Okay, who would like to continue reading for us? We, we, we go in deeper, by the way. Therefore, it is proper for a person to cry and mourn for his sins and for what he has done to his soul, the, ego, the evil consequences he brought upon it. This is implied by the following verse. Of what should a living man be aggrieved? A man of his sins. The prophet continues explaining since free choice is in our hands and our own decision is what prompts us to commit all these wrongs, it is proper for us to repent and abandon our wickedness for this choice is presently in our hand. This is implied by the following verse, let us search and examine our ways and return to God. Go on. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah. this is Teshuvah, right? By the way, this is Teshuvah. Yeah. This is right, this concept probably sounds familiar to you, right? This is right, Nachub, the Shuba. This is the return to the Derech, right? So the return to the right path. Yeah, please, if you would. This principle is a fundamental concept and a pillar on which rests the totality of the Torah and mitzvot, as Deuteronomy states, behold, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. Similarly, Deuteronomy states, behold, I have set before you today the blessing and the curse, implying that the choice is in your hands. Any one of the deeds of men which a person desires to do, he may, whether good or he may, whether good or evil. Therefore, Deuteronomy states, if only their hearts would always remain this way. From this, we can infer that the creator does not compel or decree that people should do either good or bad. Rather, everything is left to their own choice. Thank you. Any, th any, any thoughts or comments at all? Well, I think the, I guess, next to the last sentence in here, as opposed to the previous slide, it's the word compel. It's, it was the meaning. The decree is the is God's to us, is God saying thou shalt or thou shalt not. Compel, you is that's the way it's going to be. You have no free choice. So I think this makes it clearer, I think by having the word compel there, is that it's up to us. God's commanded what we have to do, but we decide. It's the qualifier of does not compel, right? right. Yeah. We, know, we know it's obligatory, right? Right. We, we know that. We, right? we know the commandments are obligatory, right? Broadly, yeah. I say that without any value attached to it, right? We know traditionally that the, the commandments are obligatory, but that it's not God who, who obliges us to follow them, right? That ultimately they're set out and, and yes. Yeah, Bob, go ahead. There's somewhat of a feeling of cynicism that I get from that is that you have free choice, but you're going to get punished uh, if you exercise it in the wrong way. So that it, is that really free? Uh, if, if, and that's where the feeling of cynicism on my part comes in, it, it, that it's somewhat of a setup. You're given full free <laughs> choice, but in the, if you do good, you're rewarded, and if you do bad, you're punished. So it's become sort of gamey in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, I, I, I'm you know 
hearkening back to early parenting, right? When, when we were taught, you, you know, uh, to say, you know, which would you prefer to do your math homework or your English homework? Not like, would you rather go outside or right? Right. Like setting up, uh, not a straw man, right? But but the right choices for people, right? Could you look at it like that? Says the the uh, striving eternal optimist in me. I, I right? Uh, yeah, I hear you, Bob. I hear you, Bob. Yeah, yeah, Lester. Well, I mean, it's it's in my mind, it's like it's the same as uh, laws on Earth. You can choose to go through a red light, or you can stop for it. You know, that's the law. If you go through it, there, there may be consequences. Sometimes you'll escape, sometimes you won't. But if you're in the wrong, it's your fault. I think, you know, there's 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 that sense in my mind. With with with, with a caveat of uh, if you get caught, right? This one doesn't have the if you get caught well, by an officer no, because because God is is omniscient, so uh, right. you, you always get caught. <laughs> And then that's got a whole other creepy, you know, kind of, is it a God, you know, kind of the Santa Claus God, right, that, that we all grew up hearing about, but isn't our God, right, a God who's keeping proverbial lists, but where does that factor in in Judaism, right, it, it, is God keeping the proverbial list, right, is there a merit-based system, right, 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 right? I, I leave that as, as a rhetorical question. So we're God to decree that an individual would be righteous or wicked. Or that there would be a quality which draws a person by his essential nature to any particular path of behavior, way of thinking, attributes, or deeds, as imagined by many of the fools who believe in astrology. How could he, God, command us through the words of the prophets? Do this, don't do this. Improve your behavior or do not follow after your wickedness. According to their mistaken conception, from the beginning of man's creation, it would be decreed upon him, or his nature would draw him to a particular quality, and he could not depart from it. What place would there be for the entire Torah? According to which judgment or sense of justice would retribution be administered to the wicked or reward to the righteous? Shall the whole world's judge not act justly? Okay. What do you think? What do you think? The predetermined? Is it? What's Maimonides saying here? Are you stuck? I think it's a little bit of circular reasoning because he's saying if there weren't free will uh, then there wouldn't be a need for Torah and so I mean Wait, say, he, say that again say that again he says that what I'm hearing is if there were not free will there would be no need for Torah because there are no rules to follow they're all preset so it, in my mind, it's a little bit of circular reasoning. The Torah is here because we have free will. We have free will because the Torah is here. But I mean, so be it. Anybody, anybody, anybody agree or disagree? Would the Torah be set if there was no free will? Would anything change about the Torah if God had both given the Torah and made us to uh, be um, obedient? It's a word I hate. There's another word that uh, it's got. It's so pejorative, isn't it? Obedient. I, what, what's another word? Faithful, I guess. Faithful in following the commandments. Compliant, maybe. Compliant. Yeah, they're they're all they all bring kind of uh, hollow and sour in my mouth. Um, <laughs> right. Well, but that, that, yeah. Go ahead. Well, it, if the Torah is a is a guide. Uh, that the, all of the wisdom that's in there is to be uh, used for us to become more discerning about how to live and who to be. And so what would be the point? <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. His writing's not mine. I, 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 you know, this is uh, beyond my pay grade, and then some, and then some, right? But his question of what would be the place for the entire Torah, right? What, what, what would it be, right? Scrolling through, making sure. Yeah, Marsha, please. Yeah. Well, but there's, but there's more in the Torah than than that. There's, there's the, there's the history. There's the, the, uh, the origins of our people uh so there's there's more than just thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do, do that so there is there would be room for the tower i think yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yes judy please i mean i think 
what's going on here is that if it was truly ordained, you're going to be good, you're going to be bad, then it wouldn't be that the judge, God, couldn't be acting justly by punishing you if you're doing bad because you had no choice in the matter. That's how he set it up. It's kind of, so it reminds me in Exodus where Pharaoh's hardens his heart and then so bad things happened. Well, if God's the one who hardened Pharaoh's heart, poor Pharaoh, I mean, that, right? that wasn't fair. Right, it's in fact, I wanna tell you, thank you. You're like a perfect, it's like a perfect shill. I think this is, um, sorry for the nauseating scroll. Um, this is exactly the text that Nahama Leibowitz cites. This is from Safaria, by the way. If you know, if you're not familiar with Safaria, it's a beautiful, wonderful site for all text, all concepts Jewish. Every one of our primary texts, every one of our secondary texts, every concept, every holiday that I cannot recommend Safaria.org any 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 higher than than I do. And it is a wonderful source written from a kind of mainstream conservative conservatox um, perspective. Whatever you're looking for, you will find it. And it takes some, some use to, to, to navigating. You can see up here, if you're not familiar with it, you can switch your language where texts are available between Hebrew and English if you click on either the A or the Aleph. And then it's got, you know, poke around on Safari. It's got great, great texts as well. But Judy, this is exactly the text that people point to for free will, right? So you can see, this is the Exodus text. Where, where God says, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs. I actually, I had it up behind my other, my other, my PowerPoint for you to see this because this is the, one of the other proof texts other than Deuteronomy that gets used, right? Where God says, and I'll harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt, right? Well, like what kind of deal is that, right? And then we go on, this is Ramban, not Ramban. That's Nachmanides, hold on. And then this is Sephorno. And... And this is Mishnah Torah here. This is the Mishnah Torah, right? This is what Maimonides says. There are many verses in the Torah and in the texts of the prophets which appear to contradict this principle. And most people are stumbling thereby for thereby and their form and therefrom. They suppose in their mind that the Holy One, blessed be God, predestines for man either to do good or to do evil, and that the heart of man is not his to bend it to his own will. Wherefore, behold, I am making clear and I, I am making clear. A great principle, Judy, this is what you were actually saying, right? Mm -hmm. Out which thou shalt know the explanation of all those verses when an individual or a people of a state do sin and the sinner transgressed consciously and of his own free will, as we have already made known in the preceding chapter. It is, it is, it is meet that retribution is visited upon him and the Holy One, blessed be God, know how to inflict the punishment and ultimately in God's control, right? There's a category of sin for which justice demands that punishment should be visited upon the sinner in this world, on his body or his property or on his infant children, God forbid, for the little children of man who have not yet reached the age of intelligence nor attained the age when they are included among those who are obliged to observe the precepts are considered man's own acquisition as it is written. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin, right? He suffers for his own sins. So this is in fact, right, in part, and you can be, you see down here, you can also be uh, punished in the world to come, right? And, and so there's kind of no escape, right? And then I just want to scroll down then lest I see your hand up in one second. Um, here, uh, this is also commenting on the same verse with, with Pharaoh. It is possible that a man should commit, and it is possible that a man should commit either one grievous, grievous iniquity or a multitude of sins so that the judge of truth will decree against him that whereas this sinner committed those sins of his own free will and consciously, repentance should be withheld from him altogether and grant him no leave to repent so that he might die and perish in the iniquity he committed. Even this is what the Holy One said through Isaiah, make the heart of this people fat and make their eyes heavy and shut their eyes lest they, lest they seeing with their eyes and hearing with their ears and understanding with their heart will return and be healed. Marsha, you might remember this also from Torah study, right? This ability to come back and to come back again to do, to do right, right? Um, it is moreover said, but they mocked the messengers of God 
and despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people until uh, there was no remedy, right? As if they, they were to say they sinned of their own will and they, 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 they've sinned of their own will and, and they deserve it essentially is what this text goes on to say. Right? Les, go ahead, you were gonna say something. Uh, yes, in my mind, back to predestination uh, does not mean that uh, you will or won't be punished. You can, in pre if you believe in predestination, you can do good and still be punished because that's predetermined. You have no choice in the matter. So I'm, I, you know, it, it doesn't strengthen the art, art, um, the argument for free will in my mind. You think you think things can be predestined and you can have free will. Um, that's not a, no. What I was hearing from that reading was that. Um, if there were predestination that the punishment uh, would or would not fit the crime. I mean, in my mind, there can be predestination. You can be forced to do evil and get away with it. That's predetermined. Or you can be good and be punished. Um, there are no consequences with predestination because it's all predetermined. Right. Right. Okay. So whether you live an upright and righteous life or you're uh, a, a sinner, you can still step off the same curb and be hit by that same bus. Right. God forbid. Right. Right. And, and so then the question becomes, and this is where my, my monies goes. What's the point? What's the point, right? What's, what's the meaning? What's the meaning to our lives, right? That is, that is his question. Right, that is his question. There's one other hand, and then I want to go. That's where, where we're going in our last four seconds, right? We have five more minutes to get to, to the point. I'll hold off quibbling about it. Yeah, you, you, while I'm pulling up the slide, you talk. Go ahead. Well, I, it, it, was, it was maybe a bit uh, quibbling about the, the, the role of Torah because whether the, it gives all the history, to me, that's a framework for always asking for lessons. And I, not that I am. A, such a Torah scholar, but uh, yeah, th that it's all about learning. Um, learning, learning, and I would push actually because Maimonides would push, and I'm not aligning myself with him, but my understanding of his reading, read, read, readings, is not just the learning, right, but the choosing. The challenge, the, yeah. The act, the act, the active. Yeah. The, the action of choosing the, right. the, the right way, right? I, I, I say that's that what I meant. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. right? Not, not just the, the learning and the growing, right? But making the, you know, the right choice according to, to his teacher. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So a person should not wonder how it is possible for one to do whatever he wants to be responsible for his own deeds. Let's go to your point, right? Is it, is it possible for anything to happen in this world without the permission and desire of its creator as Psalm states, where at whatever God wishes, he is done in the heavens and in the earth. One must know that everything is done in accord with his will, and nevertheless, we are responsible for our deeds. I want to read that one more time. Mm -hmm. One must know that everything is done in accord with God's will, and nevertheless, weird words to put together, right? And nevertheless, we are responsible for our deeds, right? It goes back to that, you know, is it predetermined and where, where do we factor in, or is it not predetermined and, and the choices are ours? How is this apparent contradiction resolved? Just as the creator desired that the elements of fire and wind rise upward and those of water and earth descend downward, that the heavenly spheres revolve in a circular orbit and all the other creations of the world follow that nature which God desired for them. So too, God desired that man have free choice and be responsible for his deeds without being pulled or forced. Rather, he on his own initiative with the knowledge which God has granted him will do anything that man is able to do. All these like knitted scrunchy, these knitted brows and scrunchy faces, right? right? What do you, but Marlene, why so, why so perplexed? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're muted, Marlene. Maybe you're choosing to be because it's-, it's I was really, saying, it's really why not? Worthy. I'm alone, why not be confused? No, um, it's a lot to think about. Yeah, yeah, right? It's a lot to think about. It's a lot to think about. Yeah. A person is judged according to his deeds. If he does good, he's treated with, 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 with,
can't say that word, somebody else can say it. If he does that, he is treated harshly. This is implied by the prophet's statements from Micah. This has been the doing of your hands. They have also chosen their own paths. The concept was also implied by Solomon in his statement, young man, rejoice in your youth, but know that for all these things, God will bring you to a judgment. Know that you have the potential to do, but in the future, you will have to account for your deeds. So Maimonides asks, could there then occur something in the world other than that, that, which, is, that which is willed by its maker? This goes back to, to the, the idea between fire and water, right? So we have free will because God gave us free will and there's no contradiction. Easier said than done. So I want to just, I want to show you quickly, right? We, we have this next layer that we didn't have time to get into, um, which is people who lack free will. What happens for certain classes of people who don't have the capacity to exercise free will the way, the way we might, right? They, in fact, there's disposition, dis, dis, um, dis, there's um, dispensation, for them not to be held accountable for their misdeeds, right? They're because they, they are seen in a class that is legally, according to Judaism, other, right? So someone who is deaf or unable to speak, somebody who, who doesn't have full capacity or a minor are exempt from the Torah's commandments, right? So you're not, a, you're not obliged to follow them and you're not, neither are you punished for not following them. The question then becomes, are you rewarded for following them, right? So this, by the way, leads us into a whole conversation of men being obligated to observe the commandments, but women not be obligated, except for the three that are time bound, right? You know that there are three that are time bound uh, for women that are not time bound rather for, for women, um, lighting candles, um, taking the end of challah when you make challah and, and burning it the way you would for an offering and the, the, the laws of family purity, the laws around menstruation um, and when you come together with, with your husband. Those are the only three out of the 613 that women are obligated to fulfill. Interesting, right? The rest, she's allowed to observe, but not obligated. So the question becomes, if you're not obligated, are you rewarded for fulfilling them? If you're not obligated, can you do them right? Like, like in terms of being a prayer leader, that's why you can't always have a woman prayer leader in a traditional setting because you can't say amen to her blessing because, right? I can't lead worship in an Orthodox synagogue because someone who needs to say amen to a bracha can't say amen to my leading it because I'm not, I'm not obligated for that mitzvah. Follow? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sexist as it is, does that make sense? 613 commandments, men are obligated to follow all of them. 613 commandments, women are obligated to follow three. The other 610, she's permitted to obligate those that, that don't have to do with temple service, right? There are a whole bunch that have to do with temple service that we can't, we can't follow anymore. But because I'm not obligated, I can't be helpful in helping somebody fulfill the, right? The, the, the say, in this case, right? Saying amen, right? Literally saying amen to a bracha, right? Because I'm not obliged to do it, right? I have the same kind of exemption as in this rendering a death meeting. Right? which I don't choose as, as a woman, right? Here is the final slide. This is my mom who's talking about Pierre K a vote. Right? And this is where, where he brings together in one big, broad, broad stroke, and I think a most beautiful way, his thinking. My mom's view on Pierre K vote, right? which that Pierre K vote is found in the Mishnah, right, in the Mishnah. Um, Pierre, K, Pierre K vote has a special treatise on the therapy of the soul, showing the way to perfection and happiness, determined the nature of his introduction to the section of the Mishnah. Its ultimate concern is exploration and affirmation of human freedom. This presupposes the need to regulate one pas one's passions and appetites for all actions must be free, volitional and self-determining if it is to be meaningful and responsible. If you had a highlighter, that would be the line that you would highlight. It follows that one who hopes to regulate the soul must be acquainted with the faculties of the soul, just as the physician must know the parts of the body. Hence the description of the soul and its faculties in chapter one, where chapter two insists that thoughts like actions are also subject to control and if appropriate censure. In other words, virtues are twofold, ethical and intellectual, and a soul that produces bad and dishonorable actions or thoughts is sick and in need of healing. And that is why Maimonides frequently draws the parallel between medical doctors and physicians of the soul. 
Well, an interesting way for him to bring together his, uh, it, it is, this is, this is Torsky who brings together Maimonides, Maimonides thinking. So this is right where we began the first week. Right? Truth does not become more true by virtue of the fact that the entire world agrees with it, nor less so even if the whole world disagrees with it. And finally, we are taught that from Moses until Moses, right? From our Moses in the Bible to this Moses Maimonides, there was no one like Moses. So what do you think? What do you think? So much more to go into with, uh, with, uh, with free will. And that is just one of his, you know, uh, any number of, of, of concepts and, and, uh, and, 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 you know, whether we are, um, uh, in fact, born with with uh, with things being predetermined and, and and where free will factors in. We will not come up with a satisfactory answer, I don't think. I don't think, but but I do wonder as we're closing, what you what you think of Maimonides, and uh, and and his work, just as we're as we're waiting in. Okay. Intrigued, frustrated, perplexed. I want to I want to watch this one on repeat. Uh, there's a lot, there was a lot going on. A lot, yeah. Okay, if you had to, I, I asked this in, in Torah study, if you had to give, if you had to give your drosh, your, your sermonette on Maimonides, what would you tell somebody else about Maimonides? Just in close. It's complicated. <laughs> Touche, yes. And noted, and noted, yeah. What else, friends? What, what would you say? It's, it's, uh, there's a lot in there, but it's, it's good to stick your toe in the water just as a start. Okay. Richard, Richard, you're muted. Or your volume is down. I think you're not muted, but your volume is down. We can't hear you. You disappeared, Richard. Anything? Anything else? Anything else at all that you're thinking? Um, this lunch and learn for me was just a nibble into my monitor. Yeah. Or spice, right? We said the appetizer. A, the appetizer. A, deli a delicious nibble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he deserves. He, my mom he deserves more, more, more studying. But really, if I could recommend two books, they would be this one, the Torsky book, which I mentioned to you, uh, the um, uh, I'm, the Maimonides Reader, and for sure, for sure, for sure, if you're looking for good translation, this um, this Guide to the Perplexed, which uh, which I also put in, I think the first, the first one. It, it's the one that if you, if you Google it, it's the first one that comes up. Um, I know the publisher is Dover, is Dover Publications. Those are the, for the most um, accessible in English read. Um, I, would, I would suggest those two if you're, if you're looking to do any more studies with me. Okay, for the perplexed. Anyway, thank you so much.